I am very happy that you are here, and I would like to introduce you to our uh, first speaker, uh, Dr. Kishan Dwarak. I said it so many times. Dwarakana. Okay. I can't tell you how many times I've practiced that who um, is an assistant professor of anesthesia at Baylor College of Medicine. He completed his uh, medical, uh, or his residency training at um, the Medical College of Wisconsin, where he was chief resident, and um, he did his fellowship at uh, Texas Heart Institute, where he's been on staff since 2011. Uh, he has uh, lectured nationally on um, the management of cardiopulmonary bypass and left heart bypass and um, heart transplants and brain protection with um, deep uh, hypothermic circulatory arrest, and he, uh, I am delighted to say that he will be presenting our lecture on cardiopulmonary bypass for you. Thanks very much, Elizabeth, for that uh, introduction. It's more than I deserve, trust me. Um, and don't worry about the name. You're not the first. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's all right. <laughs> all right, so we only got uh, 15 minutes to get this done. And um, let's cut to the chase. This is really too far of a topic to be covered in that scant 15 minutes. And while I'm sure there's somebody out there who can teach you this in a quarter hour, I'm not that guy. What I can comfortably do is try to impress on you some of the absolutes. It's safe to say that modern heart surgery, modern open heart surgery is impossible without the use of cardiopulmonary bypass. Without a heart lung machine to replace the function of the right and left heart, we couldn't do many of these mind-bogglingly compl complicated repairs, uh, which we now undertake as a matter of course, a matter of routine course in the operating rooms of many centers, uh, such as my own, uh, Elizabeth's, Gary's, everyone here, uh, and all of you that you'll shortly see. Um, Many surgical procedures, honestly, they shouldn't even be attempted if you don't have uh, cardiopulmonary bypass readily at hand. I'm thinking of complicated uh, resections of tumors of the mediastinum, for example, uh, where the, uh, the pump can sort of bail you out as a safety net. Uh, I can explain to you the techniques of cardiopulmonary bypass and drill into you how important it is that you consistent with your local culture and practice, of course, take some shared ownership of the management of cardiopulmonary bypass as it impacts the patient's physiology. And that is absolutely your responsibility as the cardiac anesthesiologist. I can emphasize that your perfusion team is a valuable resource uh, who do know their craft, and they should be engaged as fellow professionals in common cause. But they're not physicians. Uh, so having seen it done now practically daily for seven years, I feel justified in reminding all of you that placing the patient on cardiopulmonary bypass is potentially lethal to the patient if done incorrectly. Respect what you're doing. Stay engaged with the process while on cardiopulmonary bypass. All right. So what exactly is it? So here's where in a talk like this, most people are going to put up this picture. And I've shamelessly stolen this from Google somewhere and proceed to confound you with this rat's tangle of lines, arrows, and captions. Uh, but I take a little bit more simplistic approach uh, when I show this to you. You really just need six things uh, to get somebody on pump. You need a way to get blood out of the patient and into the pump. That's usually going to be a venous cannula, some cardiotomy suction that they'll use in the field, and a left ventricular vent. You'll need a path to get blood back into the patient. That's going to be your arterial or aortic cannulation. You're going to need a way to get oxygen into and carbon dioxide out of the blood. That's your oxygenator. You're going to need a way to get heat to heat and cool the blood, which is going to be your heat exchanger. You're going to need a way to stop the heart with a potassium-containing solution called cardioplegia. And you're going to way, need a way to physically pressurize the pump and pump the blood back into the patient, which is going to be your roller or centrifugal pump. All of that stuff's represented up here in various uh, schemes, di diagrams, which you'll see in textbooks, journal review articles. Uh, we're lucky enough to have Terry Crane with us over at uh, Texas Heart Institute, who's been around since uh, they were doing this in the 70s, I think, is when his career started. So he's got a, a list, and my fellows will get it at some point, I hope, of a couple hundred different things that he's seen gone wrong over his five-decade-long career. So this is, uh, this is very serious stuff, but if you do it right, um, it's very rewarding. So let's take a little moment and talk, uh, uh, who knows what this is, by the way? Anybody? This is a heparin monomer. So a word on anticoagulation. Uh, to be clear, so you all understand it, and you do by now, 
uh, we're proposing to take the patient's entire blood volume, drain it into a bucket that's sitting next to the bed, pump it through some plastic tubing to an oxygenator whose sole purpose is to maximize the contacted surface area across which gas exchange occurs. We're then gonna pump it through even more plastic hoses back into the patient. We gotta keep that blood from clotting. The blood clots, the patient's dead. So heparin, originally isolated from liver by a medical student in the early 1900s, it actually binds antithrombin-3. The World Health Organization lists it as one of those essential medications and nothing matches heparin for its reliability and anticoagulation while being easily reversed at the same time uh, with, by the administration of an antidote, which is protamine, of course. Direct thrombin inhibitors, such as bivalrudin, may be used as an alternative, but they're inferior for the relative increased intensity of the regimen you need in order to adequately uh, anticoagulate and monitor the anticoagulation. Uh, Heparin-induced anticoagulation, unlike that of a direct thrombin inhibitor, this can easily be followed using a point-of-care uh, activated clotting time measurement and it's readily reversed with protamine. Uh, and while no lower limit of ACT has been scientifically established as a safe, uh, a safe plate for placing a patient in cardiopulmonary bypass, I think most institutions would tell you somewhere between three and 400 is generally adequate, provided you monitor it regularly and maintain it there. Here's another brazenly stolen image. Uh, we can see here uh, one typical cannulation strategy for patient, pl uh, placing a patient on cardiopulmonary bypass. A multi-stage right atrial cannula is used to drain blood from the pump, to the pump rather, and that's what you see here. It comes in to the right atrium, there's multiple holes, it extends down into the IVC as well where there's additional holes, that's what they mean by multi-stage. The, uh, there will be, yeah, so the blood from the venous cannula, from cardiotomy suction, which is not pictured here, from the aortic root vent, all of this is gonna be drained back into a single reservoir or bag where it's gonna combine with all the blood that's taken from the patient. The, uh, it will then pass through an oxygenator and heat exchanger and be pumped back into the patient via an aortic cannula, which is right here. Typically placed in the ascending aorta, but could be placed anywhere in the arterial tree, uh, depending on what exactly the patient's pathology is and what the surgical considerations are. Femoral cannulation, axillary cannulation, anominate artery cannulation. I'm sure somebody else has somewhere has done other uh, semi-exotic schemes. Uh, getting the blood back into the arterial tree is the point. Um, the heart will then be stopped or pleaged using a high, uh, high potassium solution infused through, again, either the anterograde cardioplegic cannula going into the aortic root or a retrograde cardi uh, cardioplegic cannula going into the coronary sinus. Um, and so in those few sentences, I've basically told you the mechanics. Have a nice day. It's not that simple, guys. Yeah, yeah thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But there's so much more to it. So, I don't know. The, uh, a full discussion, guys, really would take a couple hours. But let's now assume that you find yourself in a case where the surgeons have gone on uh, pump. I would like to submit to you that ensuring adequate end organ perfusion is the single most important consideration you're gonna have. That's the whole point of this, is to move oxygenated blood around, get it to the vital organs, the brain, the kidneys, the liver, the viscera, and keep that patient alive while their heart and lungs are taken out of the equation. The name of the game is to keep oxygenated blood going round and round with a sufficient head of pressure to perfuse those vital capillary beds. Do that well and your patient is more likely to come through the pump run with fewer complications. As such, you're gonna become obsessed with pump flow, blood pressure, hematocrit, temperature, and these are some of the important mathematical relationships to keep in mind. The delivery of oxygen, of course, is a product of cardiac output, which while on pump is the pump flow, multiplied, of course, by the oxygen uh, content of the blood. Uh, of course, you're gonna dis disregard the second term, but for the sake of completeness, it's there. All right. Uh, adequate delivery of oxygen should be reasonably easy to ensure as it's primarily a function of the pump flow and the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood being circulated. Uh, the gold blood pressure, however, is a little bit controversial. Uh, most probably wouldn't argue with a map in the range of 50 to 60 millimeters mercury, but even this is based on an alleged lower limit of cerebral autoregulation in normal thermic pulsatile flow. Ideal blood pressures remain um, unclear as to what's perfect. My general practice is to keep a blood pressure between 50 and 60 unless there's a specific reason to drive it up to compensate for a known or suspected arterial stenosis to the vital organs, for example, carotid stenosis or renal artery stenosis. Uh, to compensate for the fact that cold blood is more viscous than warm blood, hemodilution is employed to ensure that the blood does not become excessively thick 
such that it cannot pass through those small blood vessels without an extraordinary amount of pressure. This increased microcirculatory flow may in fact increase oxygen delivery despite a lowered oxygen carrying capacity. So you go on pump, it gets dilute. What you see here is uh, a modification of the Hagen Puiselli, I think that's how you pronounce that guy's name, uh, equation. What you need to know is that the resistance to flow is, a, is directly proportional to the patient's uh, visco the viscosity of the blood, which is dependent on the hematocrit, and inversely proportional to the temperature. Blood gets thicker the colder it gets. It gets thicker the more uh, uh, blood cells are in there. It's really that simple. So it's not unusual to see that blood pressure plummet once you go on pump because there's an immediate hemodilution effect where despite adequate oxygen delivery, you're generating less resistance to that flow. We'll get to questions on that later if you have any. Um, just like in any other patient, the mixed venous oxygen saturation is almost certainly going to tell you something about the adequacy of global oxygen delivery, but you are almost certain to miss out on some small, inadequately perfused vascular beds, which contribute only a little to the total venous return. While a low mixed venous O2 certainly must be dealt with, um, don't let your guard down if the mixed venous O2 is, is normal or high. An evolving metabolic acidemia is a good sign that something's not being adequately perfused. Outcome data on cerebral oximetry, also known as NEARS, uh, it's hardly conclusive, but again, can help guide adequacy. If you got normal NEARS, you might rest a little bit easy uh, that the brain is at least being adequately perfused. A raw or processed EEG, uh, such as the BIS, uh, which begins to show an inappropriate slowing or birth suppression, that, um, that could also be a sign that the brain's not being adequately perfused. Renal uh, function, also very important. Postoperative renal failure is a real uh, concern and, and a, a dreaded complication of going on cardiopulmonary bypass. Unfortunately, the urine output really isn't a great uh, marker to follow. Uh, as all of you have known from your residency training, intraoperative urine output really doesn't tell you anything about postoperative renal function, generally speaking. Um, and then the effect of cold, there is a cold diuresis. Um, as well as many centers uh, inducing an osmotic diuresis with the use of routine mannitol while on cardiopulmonary bypass complicates the use of urine output um, as a marker of adequate renal perfusion. All right. So if you guys manage to grasp this concept on its first presentation, you're a lot smarter than I am. I always have to review this, and I still don't get it right all the time, you guys. Um, I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible, and I'm just going to go ahead and show you everything all at once. Okay, so much has been written about this topic, and while pH stat seems to be the predominant strategy in most adult centers, the ideal management strategy is still far from settled. Um, the alleged differences uh, may boil down to either providing more blood flow to the brain as a consequence of more carbon dioxide in the blood versus reducing the embolic load to the brain by constricting those same blood vessels by lowering the CO2 in the blood. So gases in general uh, do become more soluble in uh, liquids as that liquid gets colder. Think about Coca-Cola or a soda or something like that in the fridge and then one that's at room temperature. The one at room temperature is a little more effervescent. Uh, pH stat. So we, at pHstat, will do pH corrected to 7.4 at the patient's actual temperature. The sweep will be reduced, meaning the rate at which gas is passed over that blood in the oxygenator will be, re it's effectively the minute ventilation. Or you'll adjust uh, by adding CO2 to the mixture, and you're going to correct that pH to 7.4. In alpha stat, the pH is allowed to rise as the patient becomes hypothermic, and it goes up because more CO2 dissolves in the blood which leaves less CO2 above the blood, giving you a lower PaCO2 and a higher pH. All right. <laughs> You're as confused as I was. More? Yeah, so that's what I said. Uh, but what's important to know about alpha stat is that, is something missing here? Yeah, okay. 
So the, what's important to know is alpha, alpha stat is that unlike in pH stat where you will adjust things to vary the amount of CO2 in the system, in alpha stat you don't do that. The total amount of CO2 in the system basically stays the same and you're going to allow that patient to run with a, uh, a, a metabolic alkalosis effectively. Read more about this, read it a lot, talk to people about it. It's really confusing. I still sometimes don't get it at all. Uh, protecting the heart. Once upon a time, surgeons would simply clamp the ascending aorta and go. Uh, those of you who have worked with anybody who trained in that era knows that their focus is speed, 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 speed. Get that heart unclamped as quickly as possible. Because once upon a time, uh, you know, they, re they relied on a hypoxemia, myocardial hypoxemia, to actually result in cardiac arrest. You starve the heart of oxygen. Eventually, it'll go into one systolic cycle. There'll be no ATP left to release that actin from the myosin, and it won't relax. Time to reperfusion became the essential component for myocardial recovery. Speed and efficiency it was the means of protecting the heart. Uh, despite myocardial ischemia times that could sometimes be measured in the tens of minutes, uh, some proportion of those patients never recovered. And I would uh, commend you all to look up something called stone heart syndrome to uh, understand what that's all about. Cardioplegia came into wide use in the late 1970s. The high potassium solution decreased the resting membrane potential of the myocyte and thus prevents repolarization. So it's arrested in diastole, nice relaxed diastole, and you reduce the oxygen consumption just to the basal metabolic requirement of those myocytes. Uh, multiple adjuncts have been tried over the years to try to confer a higher degree of protection, as well as uh, crystalloid and blood-based blood protocols. But nothing other than adequate arrest and hypothermia have really been definitively shown to protect the heart. Um, despite cardioplegia, clamp time, specifically cardiac ischemia time, these do remain an important factor um, to the post-pump cardiac function. And in general, the shorter the clamp time, the better off you're going to be. How many more slides do I got here? Oh, God. <laughs> All right. So the, uh, the period of time around weaning from cardiopulmonary bypass is fraught with potential problems. In addition to getting the heart to function properly after reperfusion, a task which may involve the use of inotropic support or mechanical support, we must also deal with some relatively common sequelae of cardiopulmonary bypass. A certain degree of pulmonary endothelial dysfunction uh, can be anticipated in addition to the atelectasis expected from having the lungs down for an extended period of time. Many patients do experience a predictable and transient defect in gas exchange across the alveolar membranes. Reversal of heparin anticoagulation by administration of protamine can result in the dreaded protamine reaction, a sort of catch-all phrase that used by surgeons, anesthesiologists, and perfusionists to describe anything that could be from a fleeting systemic hypotension to a full-blown cardiovascular collapse in the seconds to minutes after protamine is given. Mitigation strategies include pressure support, slow administration of protamine over minutes after a successful test dose. Uh, in a worst case scenario, you can reheparinize and return to cardiopulmonary bypass to preserve the patient's life. Certainly coagulopathies of all sorts uh, can develop after cardiopulmonary bypass and full lab studies uh, and point of care thromboelastography can certainly be useful in guiding the administration of blood products and procoagulant agents uh, such as DDAVP, recombinant factor seven, prothrombin complex concentrates. You want some data rather than just uh, shotgunning it all the time. Uh, my parting thoughts for you guys. Uh, become friends with your perfusionists. They are a, a highly skilled group of technical service providers who are not physicians, but their experience is something that can definitely help you guys. Uh, like anybody else who provides you a consultant service, try to be specific about what, they want, what you want them to do and then rely on their expertise to tell you whether they can or cannot do it. But remember that you guys are the ones in charge. Uh, if you can rotate with the perfusionist, do so. Spend a week or two if that's allowed. Uh, learn their pump a little bit. Maybe you're not going to get hands on, but where does the blood go? What are they worried about when they set the pump up? Uh, we're lucky enough at THI to have a perfusion school, so those students are learning at the same time you guys are. Uh, it's a great, great opportunity. Plus, you make friends. Uh, again, remember who's in charge, you guys. You guys are ultimately in charge of that patient. The physiology, the metabolic situation, uh, that's all you. The perfusionists are a means to an end in that respect. They are supposed to do what you and the surgeon tell them to do in terms of what the pump flow is. Are we going to add blood, uh, red cells to the mix? Are we going to add bicarb, things like that? That's all up to us to figure out. Don't just rely on them. They are not mini doctors. 
And remember that the pump run itself, it's, it's not the end of it. It's really just the beginning. It's a necessary component of the anesthetic. You gotta use it as a tool, get through it, and at the other end, understand how it is that what you just did impacts where you're gonna go with the rest of the case and the transition to the ICU. I think that's all I got. Congratulations to all of you on the starts of your fellowship. Uh, good luck to you all. Huge topic, and I really wanna appreciate to uh, Elizabeth for letting me come and join all of you today. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys.